My name is Ronna Karras, and I'm very excited to be the moderator for tonight's community forum. I have just a little bit of information to share with you before we begin with our speakers, who really have all of the information that you came to hear. The first thing that I want to be sure everybody understands is, is this program tonight is a community effort. It was put together by a few of the city councilors in coordination with the city of Newburyport. These folks are here to serve us, and I think they're really doing a wonderful job of serving us by bringing these great speakers and this important information to us. So I'd like to begin by asking the city councillors who are here tonight to just please stand up for a moment and let's acknowledge the fact that they're working really hard to help us. Can you stay standing for a minute? <laughs> Can you stay standing for just a minute? I would love it. Everyone doesn't know everyone. So if you wouldn't mind, please, just raising your hand and telling everyone your name so we can have a little bit of an introduction. Thank you all very much. The purpose of tonight's forum is to provide education and information to our community about the regulations for retail marijuana sales. This is something that's happening in Massachusetts as we know. It's not a debatable topic, it's a fact. And so we're here to learn from experts about what will be happening. Um, at some point during the course of the evening, after about a half an hour of speakers and presentations, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions that have to do with the options and the things that are, in fact, still on the table or in committee in Newburyport. So we've really got kind of a two-part program, and we're excited to have everyone participate. For about the first 30 minutes, we'll hear from some speakers um, from the state of Massachusetts who will tell us what's going on. And during that time, we'll ask you to, as you're formulating your questions and your ideas, to please hold on to them. Jot them down or write them on your phones. You may find that the very next sentence or the very next speaker, in fact, answers your questions. After that, we'll bring together a committee of experts from the town of Newburyport who will be up on stage and available to answer your questions. And we'll ask everyone to queue up in front of our microphones and we'll do the best that we can to get all of your questions answered. I have no answers for you. I have no information. I am not an expert on anything. I am your moderator. My only superpower here is to make sure that when folks are standing in front of the microphone, that you're truly asking on point, on topic questions. This is not a forum for debate, although we know there is some debate on this subject. And we know that people have opinions and people have stories to tell, and we all know that they're very important. There are forums for opinions and stories and and things of that nature, but this is not it. We have 90 minutes to learn and to ask questions. And so the only time that you'll hear from me tonight other than introductions is to ask someone to please stick to the point or ask a question. And I hope you will indulge that we are in fact trying to get questions answered for tonight. We've got about 90 minutes and I'm very excited to kick off this important program with the help of our mayor, Donna Holliday. Thank you, Rona. I, I would like to also reiterate to the City Council, I appreciate all the work that you have done on this topic. We started several years ago uh, knowing that this question was coming up on a ballot uh, in terms of an ad hoc committee, just meeting with uh, stakeholders across uh, the, the community to try and get a sense of uh, where our community was going to go with this question. As I think all of you know, we voted affirmatively to support uh, the legalization of adult use marijuana, which is what the term is that's being used now as opposed to recreational use. And uh, the city council then, through a series of zoning changes, have adopted a cultivation sites in the business park. Um, probably with the square footage that they approved it would ultimately end up being two cultivation sites. And then now what we're trying to figure out is 
Do we want retail? Do we not want retail? If we do, where do we want it in our community? And uh, it's important to realize that the revenue streams are important to our city in terms of what we would do with those funds in terms of education, prevention, and more infrastructure work, uh, funding for the schools. So just sort of keep that in the, the back of your mind. Uh, we do have a moratorium until December, which gives us a, a little bit of a window to decide uh, what we would like to do as a community regarding retail. So thank you all for being here. I look forward to your conversations, your questions and discussion. And uh, I was part of a, a conversation that was held in Amesbury a couple weeks ago with members of the Cannabis Commission, as well as attorneys talking to mayors and managers uh, about this important topic in our, uh, our state. So without further ado, I will turn it back to Rona and thank you all for being here tonight. Please welcome David Lakeman. He is the Director of Government Affairs for the Cannabis Control Commission. All right, hello. Move this up a little bit. First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here at Newburyport. Um, before I get started, I just want to say a couple of words about your mayor. I had the honor of working with her uh, in my previous job at the Mass Municipal Association, and she uh, took a real lead on this issue uh, in helping the MMA understanding it um, and leading us on our board and the policy committee that addressed this issue. Um, she's always proven to be extremely smart, extremely hardworking, and always looking out for you and the other cities and towns in the Commonwealth. So truly, I want to say thank you to her and on all the hard work she really did on this issue. She, she really deserves that. Um, <clears throat> so as we heard, I am the Director of Government Affairs for the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, so. I started in March. We got started up about uh, September of last year. Um, so we'll go back just really quickly to explain how we got here and then I'll move forward to talking about uh, what you can do as a YES community and, and how things are for you here. Um, so the first slide I've got is just sort of a timeline. Many of you may know this, but I, I have found that it's sometimes helpful to explain a little bit about how we got to where we are. So this question passed in November of 2016 on the ballot. It was question four then. Uh, and. It's, it established the Cannabis Control Commission, which I'm now a part of. Uh, what the legislature did immediately, almost immediately upon passage of the question at the ballot was to delay implementation of the law by six months. Uh, during that period, they worked on rewriting the law, uh, and that was ultimately done by August of 2017. Among the changes that they made were they were expanding the Cannabis Control Commission from three members to five. Uh, they also made it an independent agency rather than one that was uh, housed within the treasurer's office. Um, so September 1st is when the Cannabis Control Commission was started of 2017. So we haven't even been up and operating for a full year yet. Um, in f for throughout the month of February, the commission held a series of public hearings looking at um, pol various policy issues. We went all over the state. Uh, listen to the concerns of folks. Uh, we heard from municipal officials, from the state government, from other concerned citizens, uh, from a whole host of different folks. And we, we took those uh, comments into account when, when putting together our final regulations. Um, those regulations were promulgated and finalized in March of this year, so just a few months ago. And uh, as of April 1st, we started accepting certain parts of the application process. Um, so to start off, I want to talk a little bit about what the application process looks like. Uh, if we can go to the next one, thank you. Um, so, oh, one more actually. No. Actually, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, so for April, for April 1st, we began app the certification applications for what we called priority applicants. So those are folks that were defined as living in an area of disproportionate impact, who um, or who had other mitigating factors that we, as part of the law, were trying to help out get started in the business. Um, we began opening this up for economic empowerment applicants and also registered marijuana dispensaries, so existing medical facilities that are already operational. April 15th, we began accepting applications um, from those priority sort of applicants. Uh, May 1st, we opened the application process for cultivation, uh, micro businesses, craft cooperatives, and independent testing labs. Um, those are those smaller, uh, different kinds of businesses you can find on our website. Um, I wanted to focus more on some of the issues that directly impact you, um, so I didn't want to get into the definitions, but I'm also happy to talk with you individually about that later. 
Um, and then May 1st, we began opening, we opened applications for, um, uh, whoop, that's double there. So uh, June, we began, June 1st, we began applications for uh, retail facilities and others uh, along those lines. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, there's, there's a couple major components to the application, and this is important for you as you're going through the process with businesses that may locate here, just in understanding what they're going through. Uh, the first packet is one of the ones that's going to be most important to you as a municipal government, uh, and that's the application of intent. Um, you have to include things in that application, such as your incorporation, the capital, the bond, your property interest, et cetera. Uh, but what's most important to you is going to be two factors. The first is that that will have to include a host community agreement, uh, which is an agreement sort of setting out the, the parameters under which that particular business is going to operate in your city. Uh, that can include um, your mitigation fee, which is set up in the, in the law, which is directly proportional to the costs you estimate that the city or town will incur, or the, the business will incur, um, often considered sort of traffic, things like that. Um, then the other part of that is a community outreach meeting. So the new businesses that are coming to town will be required to have a community outreach meeting. Um, they'll send out notice to abutters, um, they'll meet with the community and have a chance to talk with you uh, about what the future of their business is going to look like in the community. Um, it'll move, then move on to the background check process, which is all done at the CCC level. Um, we do fingerprint check, nation, nationwide civil and criminal. Um, a simple marijuana charge is not enough to disqualify someone, but trafficking is. Um, and then the third is the management operations profile, um, which is something that we work, the Cannabis Control Commission will work with the Secretary of State's office, uh, as well as the Department of Revenue. During that process, uh, we'll also then receive, we receive that information back, and then there's a period during which we come back to the city, so we'll come back to Newburyport or whoever, whomever else we're working with, to verify that they are in fact, cons there are, they are in fact operating consistent with uh, the zoning and other bylaws with the city or town. Um, so what we're encouraging is to make sure you keep an eye out for our logo uh, in your email and in your mailbox uh, during that process uh, because we're wanting to verify that and, and move along pretty quickly, especially since at that time you'll have already finalized the host community agreement with, with that business. Um, so I want to move on um, and talk a little bit about some of the parts of our regulations that are going to impact you most. Um, the first one that I'm given to understand is of great interest to um, Newburyport and especially others in the region is this, this idea of conversion um, or adding a recreational license for an existing medical facility. Um, I would say that there's probably a lot of confusion generated by that word conversion. Um, and what we want to take pains to say is that when you're looking at conversion or you're looking at an existing RMD, that's not to say that they're no longer going to offer a medical product. Um, in most cases, they're going to continue to do that, but they're simply going to be adding on a recreational license to, um, or an adult use license to whatever existing business they're doing. So if there's a cultivator for the medical business, for the medical side, you can't prohibit them from, through zoning to be, to do that for adult use. If you have an existing medical dispensary, you can't prohibit them from uh, adding a license to do the same thing with adult use. So that's what we mean through the conversion part of that. Um, and that's set up in the rewritten law uh, passed in July, or passed last August. Um, and it, that covers uh, RMDs that are registered no later than July 1st of 2017. So any of them after that point, this, this part of the law does not apply to them. But any, exist, any medical facility that was licensed prior to July 1st of 2017 is covered by that section of the law. So our interpretation of conversion is to include not only replacing the operation, as it says there, uh, of a registered medical dispensary within a mar marijuana establishment, but also to address adding marijuana establishment operations to the operations of a medical facility. So I just want to be clear about that. I think there's been a lot of confusion, and I want to try to offer some uh, clarity to that issue. Um, uh, so we can move on. Uh, the next issue um, that I think has actually been covered by Newberry Report is, the, uh, is that a, moratoria, a moratorium of reasonable length is permitted. Um, what we've seen largely from the Attorney General's office is that a, more, a reasonable length is through December 31st of 2018, uh, which I believe that Newberry Report has done. Uh, there have been one or two approved beyond that date, but most of those are for extenuating circumstances. For instance, a very small board or a planning board that doesn't meet very often, things of that nature. Uh, what we're saying as the commission is that 2018 is your year. It's, it's good to get this going. Um, you know, we're, trying to, we're happy to offer any of the guidance that we can for you. Um, 
but past that, uh, we haven't had very many promising uh, signals from the Attorney General's office that they're going to be approving those much later than December 31st of 2018. Um, the commission will not approve a license for any applicant so long as a moratorium is in place. What you, what you may have seen in some cases is that some of the applicants who applied for priority certification, uh, which is actually kind of similar to uh, the fast passes at Disney World, uh, it lets you kind of move ahead in the line um, based on a variety of factors. We did accept those applications even if the community in question had a moratorium in place, but we won't approve any actual applications. We won't go through that packet until uh, the moratorium has expired or been revoked by um, your legislative body. Um, <clears throat> we, what we do encourage is to use that time to adequately put your zoning in place. Um, and so we've seen a lot of different, a lot of communities are addre approaching this in different ways. Some communities have decided to put their um, dispensaries in industrial zones. Some have put them in downtowns. Um, I don't want to step on uh, Jim's toes, but he's going to show you, I think, some pictures of what some of these places look like. You know, they're not, they're not going to look like bunkers. Um, they're, not going to, um, they're not going to be eyesores. Many of them require pretty large capital investment. Um, and so they're, there's various places to put them based on the needs of your community. Um, and so I'd encourage you to speak with the folks who are applying for you and look at how, that's, how that can best serve your community and where it, it best fits the character of, of the neighborhood you're looking at. Um, so if we can move on to the next one. Um, another item, another possibility you have that falls under uh, section three of the new law, which is local control, is the concept of banning or limiting the number of establishments within your city. Um, one of the things you can do, irrespective of your vote, uh, is that you can limit the number of marijuana establishments in the community um, by your local legislative body um, to within 20% or more of the number of liquor licenses uh, issued pursuant to General Law Chapter 138, Section 15. Those are commonly known as package stores, um, but sometimes that can be a little bit confusing. So it, just anything that co that's covered under Section 15 there um, in that municipality. So if Newburyport had 100 package store licenses, you could limit the number of marijuana retailers to 20 uh, via action at the local legislative body. You wouldn't have to take that to a ballot. Uh, however, if you wanted to go to a complete ban, because Newburyport is a yes city, um, you would have to go to a vote of the voters um, in order to do that. Um, now, this is, this, there's a sort of two-tiered system that the legislature established uh, in, the lead, uh, in the rewrite law. So for cities and towns, there's 91 of them that voted no. Uh, they are able to sort of enact a ban through just the local legislative process. For those that voted yes, uh, it's, a, it's a different process, and it goes by the um, process laid out in the ballot question wherein you have to take it to uh, a special election uh, in order to do that. So I keep feeling like I have a clicker here and then I, uh, and then I don't, I realize I should be telling you. Um, so we can go down through, um, you can go down through, let's see, impact of banning or limiting. One more, I think. So if you do issue a ban, or you do issue limitations, uh, the, if you issue a ban, obviously the commission will not approve any applications for your city or town. Um, one of the things that I did want to mention is that if you have that 20% number and you're moving forward and you have multiple applicants uh, for each of the available licenses that you have, uh, it's not the commission's intention to sort of arbitrate that for you. Uh, we want, you're the ones having the conversations with these establishments, you're the ones having the conversations um, with the community, we wanna make sure that those decisions are being made at the local level. Um, so we've already had a couple of questions of folks saying, well, we've got you know, one license left and we have five applicants for it. Can we just sign community host agreements with all of them and send them to you? Uh, and our answer is, please don't do that. <laughs> uh, we'd really like that decision to be made at the local level. Um, and that, that's primarily for those, of you, those communities that are looking at a, at a local, at a limited number or a, a cap on the number of recreational facilities. Um, to move on, a few other things that, um, that you can do as a community, um, you, can also, you can set up buffer zones. Um, so under the state law, a marijuana establishment may not be located within 500 feet of a pre-existing public or private school providing education um, in kindergarten or grades one through 12. Um, municipal, you are able to reduce that requirement if you'd like. Um, you can uh, 
you can change that, that distance. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can regulate by bylaw or ordinance signage regarding marijuana related usage, uh, usage, uses, excuse me, um, but you can't impose a standard that's more uh, restrictive than those applied to retail establishments selling alcoholic beverages uh, within the municipality. Um, the last thing that I want to touch on briefly, especially as Newburyport considers, uh, I think, a cultivation center, is that a, a city or town isn't able to prohibit the transportation of marijuana through the city or town. Um, and the great thing is, is that you're not really going to know that you know, the marijuana is being transported through the town. You know, it's not in the interest of the company. It's not going to be uh, the marijuana ice cream truck with the dingle bell going through and the pot leaf on the side. Uh, in most cases, these are going to be very secure, uh, very nondescript vehicles that are, that are going to have a lot of security. Uh, they're, gonna, they're following the very stringent security requirements we've put in place with the two-man rule. They're going to have cameras. These are going to be really secure vehicles, and frankly, it's best that no one knows that they're going through. Um, and so that's something that's in the law. You can't prohibit the transportation. Um, and the great thing is about some of these cultivation centers is that we've set up pretty stringent like, security requirements for them as well. Um, we actually heard from, and I won't say who, a, a police chief out in Worcester County that said, well, if, you know, we're following these rules. This is place is going to be more secure than our police department. Um, and so, you know, there's requirements for fencing. There's requirements for lights. Uh, there's requirements for security personnel and all sorts of other issues there. Uh, and we're going to be reviewing those very, very thoroughly. And we're encouraging any applicants to have conversations with uh, local police departments to be sure that everyone's on the same page, everyone's working from the same book as they look at this issue. Um, right, so the last, the last slide I have here is a little bit more on the host community agreements. Um, to reiterate, uh, so for a cultivation facility, you don't have the option of enacting the 3% local option tax, uh, but what you do have the option of is enacting a community impact fee of up to 3% of gross sales, um, and that's paid to the host community, um, and the, so long as, and this is important in the legislation, so long as the fee is reasonably related to co real costs imposed in the municipality due to the establishment of an RMD or um, uh, recreational or adult use facility operating there. Um, the agreement is also only uh, effective for up to five years. Uh, so past that point, uh, these agreements will need to be renegotiated. And that's a good chance for both communities and the business to, to assess sort of how the relationship is going, what things are looking like from, from both sides' perspective, and to work that out. And then we, again, will require um, you to send in verification that you've, you've had those discussions there. Um, just a brief update in terms of sort of what we're looking at at a statewide level. Um, so we've received um, 80, we have 84 pending applications as of last week. I know that number is going to change at our public meeting on Thursday, so this is slightly outdated information, but it's, it's still pretty good. Um, we have one craft marijuana cooperative, 27 cultivators, many of which are uh, in Berkshire County and Worcester County, um, seven micro businesses, nine product manufacturers, three research facilities, 19 retailers, uh, one transporter, and 17 establishment agents. Um, and so there's still a number of applications coming in, and we're, we're reviewing those pretty thoroughly. Um, throughout that process. And I know I'm getting close on time, um, so I can say what I want to end by saying is that we're here as a resource. Uh, we hope that we can be here uh, to help you uh, as you're looking at how to do your zoning, as you're looking at what you want that impact to be. Um, give us a call. Give me a call. Um, if you go to the next slide, oh, looks like it's off. Um, I've actually put my information up there. Um, you can find my contact information. I've got a stack of cards here, and it's on our website. Reach out to us. We want to help. We want to make this, uh, as our mission statement says, uh, safe and equitable and efficient, um, and we're here to help. So with that, I want to, th I think, uh, thank you again for having me here, and I'll turn things over to uh, Jim Borgazani. Thank you, David, very much. Uh, Jim Borgasani is here also to represent what's happening in the state. Thank you, and thanks to everybody for coming out for this uh, very important topic. I'm gonna pull this off and look. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna pick up where Dave left off, just to think about how best to regulate cannabis in Newburyport, safe and smart regulation in Newburyport. Uh, and we'd like to see you know, smart and safe regulation across the state. We think we're heading there. Uh, next slide. Um, 
Just a few things about the law that was passed in November and then passed by the legislature in 2017. Um, it allows adults to possess a limited amount of cannabis. This is not unrestrained legality. Uh, there's nothing to prevent anybody from going to a package store and buying 20 bottles of vodka. You are limited to possession amounts in cannabis. Um, the, uh, we already know the Cannabis Control Commission was created. Um, it's going to require testing of all uh, product. That's one of the great benefits of legality. There are co cannabis consumers in Massachusetts in every town in, and plus in every state in the nation. Um, up until now, the market has been dominated by street dealers and criminals just because marijuana has been prohibited. Um, legality will make sure that these consumers get the same protections that every other consumer gets. Tested, safe product, purchased in a safe and secure location not on a street corner, not from somebody who is selling product that you don't know where it came from, you don't know what's in it. They may be selling more dangerous drugs along with it. Um, cities and towns, again, limit, uh, as Dave mentioned, the uh, ability to limit cannabis operations, the 20% rule. Um, the total tax, uh, it's 23% total tax. That includes the 3% uh, local um, um, option, uh, a host community agreement. Um, and remember, public use of driving uh, under the influence remains illegal. You cannot use it in the car. You cannot have an open container in the car. It's the same rule as with alcohol. Not only can you not you know, have alcohol, drink it, you can't even have an open container. Same with cannabis. It has to be in a closed container, locked in a glove compartment, or some other uh, area of the car. Um, and public consumption, again, is illegal. You cannot consume in public, yes. Well, that's a whole different topic. I can answer that when we get to the second round of questions, I think. Um, and next slide, please. Um, vote no on a ban. Why would you vote no on a ban? Um, just quickly, for public safety reasons. Voting, banning cannabis, as some towns have done, all that's doing is allowing the criminal market to continue operating in that town. You're not banning cannabis from towns. Uh, prohibition, 100 years of prohibition, we've learned, it didn't ban anything. People want to consume cannabis. Whether anybody likes it or not, agrees with it or not, it's a fact. And I think society now, if you look at the polls nationally, people are realizing it's better to be regulated than to be prohibited because prohibition has only created a criminal class that dominates the industry. When you look at the entire nation of Canada is gonna go legal this year, uh, more and more states going legal. So this is clearly something that society is moving toward. Uh, second, the revenue, and we'll get into this a little bit more uh, later on, but it does create revenue for the town. And I'm gonna give you two models that you know, can take a look at possible revenue that you'll see in Newburyport, or could see in Newburyport. Next slide. Um, just a few things, Dave mentioned uh, some of this stuff. You can determine the location through zoning and the time through the agreement. That'll be part of the uh, host community agreement, the operating time for, the, uh, for a facility. Um, they, the 20% rule, um, host agreements with the 3% revenue share, uh, restrictions on signage, and no window displays. It's not gonna be like a package store. We'll see this later in the presentation. You cannot see product if you're walking by the store. You cannot see uh, signage. You cannot see advertising. Very, very different from what you can see now in a package store. Um, and ob obviously, restrict access. You have to be 21 years old or over to purchase cannabis. The criminals who have been controlling and the street dealers who have, who have been controlling the cannabis market for decades, they don't check IDs. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to talk about two models for uh, anticipated revenue. It's tough to make a, make a forecast for revenue. So what we've tried to do is look at two models, two existing things. One is the sales that are, are occurring in, uh, in medical uh, cannabis facilities now in Massachusetts. The average sales for these facilities last year was $8 million. Um, some sold a lot more, some sold less, but the average was $8 million. Um, that's on a fixed base. There are a little more than 52,000 medical card holders. You can't even walk into one of these things unless you have a medical uh, uh, cannabis card. Um, so that's on a fixed consumer base. Obviously, uh, with, with full legality, you can sell to anybody who's 21 and over. So you're not looking at a fixed consumer base anymore, except by age. Um, 
Obviously, you know, um, uh, adult use sales means a larger consumer base and greater sales. Um, with the $8 million, if Newburyport or any other town opts for the full 6%, the 3% um, sales tax that goes right to the town, local sales tax, and the 3% that you can ask for in the host community agreement, 6% would be $480,000 of, of an $8 million uh, revenue model. Uh, that does not include the other ancillary uh, economic benefits, you know, jobs, direct jobs in the facility, contracting jobs for building out the facil facility, and all the other things that come with the new business, landscaping and everything else, or property taxes that would go to the town. Next slide, please. Um, and you can see with $480,000 where, where it would put that as far as the largest taxpayers in Newburyport. I think it would come in second behind uh, Newburyport Manager LLC. Um, so just gives you an idea of what, you know, under this model, what could happen. The next model is, um, if we could change the slide, is what's happening in Colorado. We looked at the, ant the per capita sales in Colorado for 2017. Colorado is you know, a little less population than Massachusetts. Uh, it came to, um, Colorado has 5.7 million people, we have about 6.5 million. The per capita annual sales in uh, Colorado was $191.22. That is taken from the $1.09 billion in adult use sales divided by the population of Colorado. Obviously, every person in Colorado doesn't buy cannabis, but the people that do, when we look at a model, we distribute it across the entire population, it comes to $191.22. Um, transpose that onto Massachusetts, adjust for population, and you come up with, at the 23% sales rate, uh, sale, uh, tax rate, $286 million in annual revenue to the state and to localities, uh, which is exactly what the Mass Department of Revenue projected uh, when they gave an assessment to uh, the uh, Select Committee on Marijuana um, earlier in 2017. And next slide. Um, under that model, if we look at some of the, you know, the population base that you might expect in if, if a retail facility were to open a Newburyport, and again, this is just looking at surrounding towns. Um, it could go up, it could be more, it could be less, but we just want to do an approximation of a model. I listed some of the towns, um, Newport Report and some of the surrounding towns, um, and total, came up with a total population, total consumer base perhaps of 48,749. If we transpose that Colorado per capita uh, purchase of, of cannabis on that population base, you come up with about $9.3 million in annual sales. At the 6% rate, that would boost potential revenue up to $558,000 in Newburyport. Report. Uh, we can go to the next slide. That would put it uh, above uh, the current top uh, taxpayer in Newport. Uh, new report, I'm sorry. So again, it's difficult to make an accurate forecast. We try to do it by looking at you know, other states, the models from other states, and what's happening in Massachusetts on the, on the medical side. Uh, we can go to the next slide. What will cannabis stores look like? What will a retail facility look like in Newburyport or any other town in Massachusetts? It won't look like this. This is from Haverhill. This is a store that sells, I think, um, um, smoke shop. It's a smoke shop. It sells uh, um, uh, appliances and uh, other things for tobacco and for cannabis, I assume. Um, there will be no window displays. You will not be able to look into any facility and see any product. You will not, there'll be no signage. There'll be nothing that you see in this window. Next slide. It certainly won't look like this. This is a package store, and you can see there's representation of products. You see the beer bottles, you know, mural, a mural, or graphics of beer bottles. Probably in this you can't really tell, but there's actually, there's product under the windows, in the windows. You can see bottles and things like that. There's signage, there's um, signage of product, there's product signage. I think there's a Budweiser, you know, uh, neon light. It will look nothing like that. That is prohibited under state law. It will look like something like this. No product displays, fairly inconspicuous. Um, you can't look in and see anything, no product. Uh, there's a small sign up front, up, up top, um, and the next slide, or something like this. This happens to be a facility in Brookline, uh, the Netta 
uh, New England Treatment um, Access, I think it's the acronym. Um, it's in a former bank in Brookline. Again, no product displays, no window displays, no signage, other than, again, discrete signage that's controlled by the community. You have a reasonable control over the signage. Um, so that's gonna be what it more looks like. Uh, people have, I think, an image in their head, pot shop, and you think about something that's, you know, everything's hanging in the window, people are leaving, smoking, well, they're not. Everything's gonna be sold in, in, in sealed containers. There's no public consumption allowed under the law. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is what the interior will look like. Different from a package store as well. You walk into a package store, there's product on the shelves. You grab your product, put it in your, your, your cart, go to the point of purchase and buy it. Very different in a cannabis shop. This is more like, it's more like a jeweler's store. Everything is in a cabinet. Uh, product is behind the counter. Um, you can't walk around, pick up product, put it in a cart. It's very, very different. Uh, the next slide, this is a retail facility in Colorado. Same idea, cabinetry, uh, product behind glass or behind the counter, very different from the liquor store model. This is what we're gonna see in Massachusetts. This is what exists on the medical side. This is what will exist on the adult use side. We can go to the next slide. Um, just a few things about the facilities. Uh, Dave mentioned some of the uh, security measures that will be in place. To get into a retail facility, there will be a vestibule, a sally trap, they call it. If you go in, you have to present ID. It'll be, there will be a security staffer there. This will be partitioned. You won't be able to see into the facility from this little vestibule. Only after you present a valid ID will you, will you then be allowed into the facility itself, into the retail area. So this is a vestibule that's partitioned, that's locked with a security guard. You go in, you present ID. If it's a valid ID, you can then be let into the retail area. Um, second ID check at the uh, point of purchase. So your ID will be checked again when you uh, go to pay for your product. Um, complete background check on all employees. Uh, surveillance cameras in the vestibule, uh, in the sales area, in all areas that deal with product, in the inventory areas, in the storage areas. Video surveillance, um, video surveillance of the, of the perimeter, video cameras up and down the street if it's on a street location, you know, around the parking lot if it's a parking lot location. Um, we've actually seen the video from these actually help uh, increase public safety in the communities that these are located in because it gives uh, police, you know, more eyes on um, activity in, up and down the street, not just around these locations but up and down the street and in the area where these locations are, uh, are, um, are present. Uh, direct link alarm systems to the police department and product delivery seed to seal protocols. Uh, very uh, strict uh, seed to seal inventory controls. When something leaves a supplier, they take, uh, they take a uh, reading of what is leaving, what is going on the van. They take another reading when the, when the van or the vehicle delivers, and then right to the point of sale. So it's tracked from the seed, which is you know, the very beginning of the cannabis growth, to the ultimate sale, no matter what sort of uh, uh, um, form that cannabis takes, whether it's leaf or edible or whatever. Um, so it's a very, very strict inventory control and sales control all along the way of the product delivery. Uh, the next slide. Uh, what has happened in other legal states? Um, we've seen no increase in youth use. In every state, every survey has seen no increase in youth use. We haven't seen a decrease, we just have seen it flat. Uh, which is completely contradictory to what opponents were saying. They said youth use are going to go, rates will go through the roof. It has not happened. And those are not industry statistics. Those are state studies and federal studies. Uh, we have not seen uh, an increase in motor vehicle OUI deaths or arrests. It just hasn't happened. It's been stayed at the same level in, in every state. There's ups and downs. Most of the fatalities, if you look at Colorado, uh, the, the person in charge of you know, writing the annual transportation report uh, has said that the increase in vehicle deaths in Colorado were due to lack of seatbelt use uh, and distracted driving. His report didn't even mention cannabis. Um, we've seen no increase in public safety budgets in towns or 
at the state level, and I'll go through that in a minute as well. And substantial new tax revenues in every state that has had uh, a legal uh, cannabis system. We've seen uh, great revenues coming into uh, the town, the, the towns and the state coffers. Um, and no federal, no federal intervention in legal states. I'm sure you are all aware that cannabis is still illegal at the federal level. Um, we've not seen a single case of the federal government coming in and interfering with a lawfully operating cannabis facility in any of the states um, that are currently legal. And uh, a couple things. Um, I've seen many reports, and there's often people say, well, it's going to increase our public safety costs dramatically, you know, police, everything else. So I looked. I looked through all sorts of towns, their budgets, everything else, headlines, news. I couldn't find a single case of any cost increases to towns. I took one town, Aurora, Colorado, that has a thriving legal, uh, uh, legal cannabis industry. Um, I looked at their public safety staff levels uh, for the years leading up to legality and the years since legality. Um, the, they had 580 to 648 in 2012, so there was a 10% increase in uh, the public safety staff, police and public safety staff, in the years leading up to uh, cannabis legality. We looked at the next one, cannabis, um, uh, it became legal in Colorado in 2012, sales began in 2013. Uh, in the years since the legalization, we've seen a 5% increase in staffing, police and public safety staff. Um, so we have not seen a ballooning increase. In fact, we've seen a slower rate of growth in the public safety and police department in Aurora than it was the years before legality. And basically the budget, the same thing. Uh, before, in 2012, when uh, legality passed in Colorado, uh, the public safety and public um, health budget in Aurora accounted for 35% of the total budget. Uh, and to the most recent year, 2018 budget, it accounts for 32%. So we're not seeing an increase in public safety costs or public health costs. Uh, the next slide. Nor are we seeing it at the state level. Uh, the public health budget in Colorado in 2012 was $446 million. That was 2.2% of the total budget in Colorado. Uh, in 2018, the most recent year, 2012, again, that was the year legal when the, the year they passed the legal measure in Colorado. In 2018, the public health budget in Colorado was $580 million, slightly less of the total budget, 2%. Um, same thing with public safety. That includes Colorado State Patrol um, and other police departments. Um, they, they accounted for $320 million in 2012, 1.5% of the budget, about the same percentage uh, in 2018. We're not seeing an increase in public safety costs. We have seen public, we have seen cannabis tax revenue pay for 22 new police cruises in Colorado. Um, and lots of other stuff, schools and everything else. Um, in Oregon, the same thing. Um, I won't go through them all, but you're gonna look at 2012, 2018. We haven't seen any increases in public safety, to public, uh, public health budgets. Uh, nor have we seen, this is a study from the um, uh, Colorado, the Col Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Flat youth use. We have not seen an increase in youth use in Colorado. Uh, and the next slide. Basically, this is the last slide. Today's unregulated system, well, really yesterday's unregulated system, we have 900,000 to a million uh, 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 cannabis users in Massachusetts. Up until now, they've been getting unregulated, untested, in many cases, unsafe product because they had to, because they couldn't, they did not have the option to purchase it uh, legally or in a safe location. Um, in uh, the, under a new system, the system that will be in place is starting in July, that's being put in place now. You have licensing and store security, both local and state regulated. Uh, you have purity testing, product testing across the board, um, portioning and labeling uh, so that you know exactly what you're getting, you know exactly what's in it, you know exactly who grew it. Um, packaging, child resistant packaging, everything that leaves a cannabis retail facility will be in a child proof container. Um, restricting underage access. Again, the security at these things is far uh, uh, more uh, effective than any security at a pharmacy or at a package store. And pharmacies, remember, they sell drugs that can actually kill you. And the, the cannabis facilities are going to be much more um, uh, vigilant in their security. And uh, 
to marketing to minors. There's no advertising to minors allowed. Uh, there's no Joe Camel. There's not going to be any furry, you know, creature who appeals to kids. You can't sell a product that resembles a commercially available candy. You can't even, you cannot advertise at certain hours when children will be watching TV. The Cannabis Control Commission and the legislature has set very strict guidance on any, any advertising. Um, and obviously taxation of all sales. Up till now, it's been dominated again by street dealers and cartels who don't pay taxes and don't check IDs. We're not introducing anything to Massachusetts or to Newburyport that isn't already here. All we're doing is transitioning from an illegal market controlled by, again, street dealers and cartels to a legal market that's regulated by local and state officials and that pays taxes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I, I've taken a ton of notes. I don't know about anybody else. Um, it seems to me that so far we've really learned two important things. The first from David was really about how cannabis businesses will be licensed. And the second part from Jim was the impact of the licensed retail businesses. So that looks at the state level. Now we have an opportunity to look at it from the Newburyport viewpoint. So what I'm going to ask is that, is that our panelists come and join us. And these are all local folks. And what they will do is, after a brief presentation, they will start taking your questions. So the first thing I'd like to do is ask um, Larry Junta, who will be our speaker, if we can welcome Larry, please. Thank you. And I'm also going to ask our panelists to come up and sit on the stage so we can all stare at them and then ask them questions. Andrea Egmont, who's the director of Newburyport Youth Services. Frank Giacalone, director of public health. Mark Murray, who's the city marshal of the Newburyport Police Department. Andy Port, who's the director of the planning department and Susan Vaccaro, who's the current superintendent of the Newburyport Public Schools. So we have two things that are going to happen here. Oh, and do we want Heather to join us on the stage or is she bringing it on home? Bring it on home, okay, so we have a few minutes for Heather. So. I think so, yes. Jim and David are going to stay with us, and this will be your opportunity right after Larry finishes to come up and I'll invite you up to ask your questions. And again, we'll ask that the questions be asked into one of the two microphones, but also to be on point and relevant to the information for tonight. Thank you all very much. We'll, we'll hear from Larry okay. now. Okay, great. So my name is Larry Junter. I'm the Ward 5 City Councilor. I'm also a member of the City Council's Planning and Development Subcommittee. So all the zoning goes through our subcommittee. So what I want to do is take a few minutes today and tell you what we've done since January and then what's still in committee that we're working on, just sort of give you a, a new report update on this. Um, as a committee, we've been discussing multiple marijuana ordinances, including a cultivation zone, retail zones, a moratorium on retail sales, and a potential ballot question in regards to marijuana retail sales. In January, a cultivation ordinance was submitted to the council. It included expanding the existing medical medical marijuana cultivation zone within the industrial park. Many folks may not know, but for four years, we've actually had an approved zone in the industrial park for medical marijuana and for the sale of medical marijuana. Um, no business um, established themselves here, so it never happened. Um, after multiple meetings, amendments to the ordinance, and input from the planning board and our city solicitor, KP Law, a cultivation zone was passed by the full council on June 11th. The cultivation zone includes the majority of the industrial park, but it has two buffers. One buffer is around the uh, daycare center on Graff Road, and the other buffer goes around Opportunity Works. 
Um, we did put some restrictions in on cultivation. The first restriction we put in is we said there cannot be more than 100,000 square feet of cultivation in the park and there can only be two cultivators. Those are the things that we learned from KPLAR in our, our meetings, is that we do have the ability to shrink the zone. We can't make it zero, but we can make it as small as we want. We can also in increase it. Um, if it. If it looks like it's something that's working out for the city, we have the ability to change that. Um, some of our discussion points when we were talking about the cultivation zone was as everybody kept telling us, oh, this is the gold rush, you got to get into it. Um, you got to get going quick on this. And our worry was is if we opened the entire industrial park to cultivation, we could end up with so many cultivators that if this market does go flat in a few years when there's more cultivation happening um, than there's need, that we may end up with some empty buildings. And then the thought was out there, well, what happens if the federal government legalizes this? Whoa. I know. Who's in charge of the lights? There we go. Uh, so then the next, the next discussion point was, what happens if the federal government legalizes this in all 50 states, and you end up with one agricultural company in the Midwest that could grow enough marijuana for the whole country? So we started to have real debates and conversation about those things, and we wanted to make sure that we protected our industrial park. Um, it was important to us. One of the, um, the major things is the folks, not all the folks, but a good many of the folks in the industrial park didn't want cultivation to begin with. Um, they came to many meetings. They told us it was something they weren't interested in having in the park. Um, the Chamber of Commerce came out to us. They told us they weren't interested in having cultivation in the park either. So we were weighing a lot of different things that were coming at us. And so what we decided to do was uh, take, um, and as uh, Councilor Shan mentioned to us in the debate, we decided to take Charlie Baker's advice. He said, crawl before you walk and walk before you run when it comes to marijuana um, in Massachusetts. Take your time, do it right, be thoughtful about it. So I think on the cultivation, we were thoughtful about it. Um, we're willing to give it a try. We want to see how it goes. Um, we do have some history. We've got four years of medical um, cultivation out there. And from talking to other towns, there are some good cultivators and there are some bad cultivators. So we want to make sure when we go through the planning process that we end up having good companies that have the assets behind them to be able to do a good job and be good neighbors. Um, some of the other uh, issues out there are over cultivation of marijuana. We saw that in Oregon where Oregon actually produced more marijuana than they were selling and that depressed their price. Marijuana is going to be a very expensive business in Massachusetts. There's so many regulations that that also is something that needs to be taken into consideration. So, I'm just sharing with you the variety of different things that were brought up in our debate, just so you know that we did spend some, quite a bit of time on this. Um, as part of the cultivation ordinance, we remove retail sale from the industrial park completely. That's something the business park wanted us to do. So that opened up a new host of discussions about now where to put retail. So on April 30th, retail ordinances were introduced proposing a, meet, uh, a uh, marijuana retail zone on Lower State Street. Basically, it's from the rug store down to the rent-a-car place, and then one on Story Ave that goes from Market Basket up to about Shell, the Shell Station, and then down to about Hodges. And, and again, I'm just giving you approximates on that. On June 11th, we had an additional ordinance that was submitted, including all businesses within the city district, including all B1 business districts, B2 downtown business districts, and B3 neighborhood business districts. These ordinances are still in committee. The maps of the proposed zones can be found on the city's website in our June 11th City Council packet. So if you go on the City of Newburyport's website and you go to City Council and you go to the June 11th packet, you can see the different maps. They're in there for you to take a look at. 
Um, on May 14th, we, um, we submitted a temporary moratorium on the retail marijuana. Um, it did pass, um, as it was stated before, it expires on December 31st, and it says um, that it will be in effect till December 31st, or until such time as the city holds a referendum on, a, on the matter or adopts a marijuana retail zone, whichever occurs earlier. So the way that the moratorium works is if we're able to figure out the zoning for retail, then the moratorium is over. If we end up going to ballot, whatever is decided at the ballot box, one way or another, we, we move forward, forward in one direction or the other. Um, we felt the moratorium was needed um, due to the July 1st deadline. Um, since Newburyport voted in favor of recreational marijuana, if we did not create a retail marijuana zone, then any per prospective marijuana retail operation could open in any business, business district. So to, to give it to you plainly, if we don't make a zone, then a retail marijuana company can go into any business zone. Um, that's just the way that the law is written. So for us, the moratorium made sense. If you think about it, when the slide that you saw earlier, we found out um, late in March what the final rules were. And then business was to open July 1st. And as you know, government doesn't move very fast. So we felt the best thing to do was put a moratorium on, hit the pause button, and then just sit back, see if the state's going to make any more changes, find out what's going on, uh, on in other towns, do some more investigation. We, made it, we needed more time to look at impacts in our own community. We needed to learn more about um, what Jim had spoken about today, about you know what would a pot shop look like? How are things labeled? How do we make sure kids don't get their hands on it? As a council, we have a lot of things we have to process. Um, if you think about um, you know the things that we do um, over the course of a year, I've become an expert on paper and plastic. Um, that's what happens. These things get put at, put at you as a city councilor, and you have to do your studying. So the moratorium made sense to us, so we could study this issue and find out if it's right for Newburyport, and if it's right, where should it go? Um, on May 14th, we also introduced a ballot question, which is still currently held in the Planning and Development Committee. It simply states the ballot question, should marijuana retailers be prohibited within the city of Newburyport, yes or no? So if it comes down to a ballot question, we already have it in committee um, for discussion if that's the direction that we decide to go to. So to wrap up, cultivation is completed and approved in the industrial park. We have a moratorium in place right now till December 31st on retail marijuana shops. And we have uh, two retail ordinances and a ballot question in committee. And that's what I have for you. So now is our opportunity. We have another 30 minutes or so with questions. I've got about 16, so we won't start with me. But if there's anybody who does have a question related to what we've learned tonight on point on the topic, um, please do come up. And we can just line up and we'll take them one by one. Please go right ahead. Hi. Uh, do you have any guesstimates regarding the tax revenues that will be received by the city of Newburyport as a result of opening um, marijuana uh, adult sales establishments. Thank you. Sorry, uh, this is Andy Port. I'm the director of planning and development. Um, thank you. Our finance director uh, will be looking into that uh, with our chief administrative officer, uh, and I'll be involved in that discussion as well. But we have not um, put that uh, more definitive estimate put put together yet. It's still being worked on. Hello, so um, I remember you mentioned the regulation of the child safety packages, so I just want to clarify, um, does this include sort of both, you know, the exterior of the packaging and the um, interior of the product and not looking like, say, a candy per se? I know Colorado um, last year passed a law that banned the manufacture of um, synthetic goods that uh, looked similar to children's candy, so is that what was suggested slash mentioned when you were talking about the regulation of uh, product? Just a clock. 
just to clarify. Uh, I'll just come over here. Sorry, I'm just going to stand awkwardly here. Um, so from our perspective, um, we have put some pretty strict limitations on what the packaging looks like. It cannot be packaged to minors. It cannot be uh, in the form of a cartoon character or of an animal. Um, one of the things we heard a lot two years ago was worry, concern about pot tarts, things like that. They're, that's not going to be here. Uh, in fact, uh, we're, we've got pretty strict uh, labeling requirements, uh, and that includes on a lot of the food products. So there's some sort of labeling. Uh, we have it broken down. Um, we're working to make sure that um, it's clear how much of a dose, um, whatever the particular food is. So if you have, you know, a bar of chocolate, you know, and it breaks into four pieces, you know, one piece is a dose. We want it to be clear that that's what it is. Um, and I, I don't have it here, but it's pretty. It's on our website. It's in many of our guidance documents. It's going to have a big um, triangle with the marijuana leaf with THC in this product, not for use under 21, things like that. We take that really seriously, and we're going to be making sure that this is never marketed to children, that it's as far away as possible. Um, in fact, if you look at some of the products out of Colorado now, I mean, they're as boring and plain as packed. I mean, they're more boring than sort of a um, like generic ibuprofen from, from CVS right now. Um, and so that, that's our goal. And so that's what we're looking at. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Hi. Um, one request, and that would be the policymakers look to the most current research. It seems like every day there's another report coming out about health effects or, you know, driving effects or workplace effects of marijuana and to be sure that you get the most current research because it is being worked on heavily. Secondly, I had a question about, I guess it's about the packaging and advertising. Do the packages contain health warnings? And to the extent that the advertising is allowed, you said they can't advertise to youth, but if you know, a retailer puts an ad in the daily news, the kids are gonna see it. How, how is the advertising controlled? Okay, just so you had two kind of questions there. The first I wanna mention is that we have, um, per statute, we have a special commission on operating under the influence. We had our first meeting last week. Um, it's comprised of law enforcement officials, um, professors, uh, sociologists, things like that, who are looking at this question and trying to figure it out. Uh, in essence, the legislature looked at, at the, the question of operating under the influence and so went, that seems pretty hard. We're going to put together a study commission for it. And so we're looking at a lot of those questions about, work, about the workplace, about um, operating vehicles under the influence, uh, and we want to be able to, to really take a, a good look at that. And I think that that's a group that's going to do a good job. Um, so we're gonna, we have a, a bi-weekly meeting scheduled and we have a report that's due to the legislature uh, in January of next year, so keep an eye out on that. Um, and those are public meetings, so if you're ever interested, um, I would encourage you to attend. Uh, the last one was at the Arlington Police Department. I think this one, the next one's gonna be some in, in Boston, but after that we're gonna try to get all over the state, so I'd encourage you to keep an eye out for that. Uh, in terms of the packaging, there are gonna be health warnings. Um, again, we have it's all laid out in our regulations that we're going to be keeping a pretty firm eye on that, um, including nutritional information. Um, and this is of concern to folks. Uh, also, we have a verification system even so far as to uh, tell you if it's actually organic uh, marijuana or not. So this is something we're, we're certainly taking very seriously. Yep. Uh, I think he's right there. Yep. Uh, just one other thing is the zoning regulations. Um, I had drafted some of the zoning regulations the city council has recently adopted. and. One of the provisions that we put in there was a prohibition for the retailers of having colloquial references to marijuana, um, you know, pot, weed, things like that, um, in their, their graphics, their text of the signage, just so that it, um, as the graphic that you saw uh, during the presentation earlier, it would look like any other business on the street as opposed to calling itself out explicitly. But what about advertising? So, yeah, I actually meant to touch on that. I'm sorry. The, uh, there's also regulations for us as to where they can advertise. If there has a certain percentage, it has to be a, over 80% of the audi intended audience has to be adult or over 21. Um, so if you have, for instance, a what we've seen a lot of places, there's a community post board at a grocery store. You can't put up an ad there. If you know, Even especially in, in, in papers, there's going to be a lot of limitations to where you can advertise. Um, that even means on their websites, um, you, you can't, you're not even going to be able to go without verifying your age, things like that. Um, so we, we have tried to, to look at that as much as possible. You can't advertise at a you know, a, a pop concert. You couldn't advertise at a Taylor Swift concert, you know, things like that. Okay, and quickly on enforcement, what is the penalty for selling to a minor and where do those p uh, fees go? Who gets the fees? We'll lose here. The penalties for selling to a minor, I believe it's... Uh, 
It's the same as it is now, uh, which is, it's a misdemeanor, I think, in two and a half years, ultimately in a county house of correction if convicted. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Two questions. One is about how many licenses there are available for retail. Step a little closer. We can't oh, hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering about the retail. Uh, you've mentioned that for the cultivators, there can be two licenses in Newburyport, but what about retail shops? What are we? That's two. What's our? Um, that hasn't been established yet. Um, we have talked about a ro prohibition, or I should say a limitation, to 20% of what the liquor licenses are in the municipality, uh, which is something that we're allowed to do under the state statute. Um, so 20% of the number of liquor licenses for uh, package type stores in New Report would be the, the cap we might have. Um, that is my, would be my assumption right now about okay. what will apply to that if there are retail sales, and this is pending the moratorium uh, as well as the ballot question uh, to see whether or not the retail sales are allowed. But I would expect that that uh, limitation would be put in there. It's ultimately up to the city council, but uh, I would imagine Imagine that might be one of the restrictions. Okay. Do we know um, how many liquor licenses there are? That would end up being that result would essentially end up being two. Um, so, oh, okay. yeah. Um, may if I, I could weigh in just briefly, um, yeah. one of the things that's come up, and this is more of a general issue, not specific to Newburyport, um, is that one we've issued a, a guidance. It's not a hard rule, but it's a guidance that if you come out to a strange fraction, that you should just always round up. Um, and the reason for this is that your the number of liquor licenses isn't static. It's not going to always stay the same. And as that goes up, um, you know, the number of that 20% number will change as well. And so just that's something we want folks to keep in mind is that it's not 20% of the liquor licenses as of 2018, but just the 20% of that number as going forward. Um, so just that's something I want to make sure that every, every place I go, I want to mention that for planning boards, for municipal officials that keep in mind that as, as your number of, as you add liquor licenses, not that that's an easy process, as we all know, but as you add those, um, your marijuana number may go up as well. Okay. And then just real quick, what will it take to put this to a ballot question? Well, I, I can't speak for the city council. The city council has in committee a ballot question that they're reviewing, and uh, I'll, I will leave that uh, to the city councilors to decide. Yeah, I'm curious to know like, what public input can be made to make a ballot question. Like, well, I don't know what that process is. I'd love to know. Uh, I mean, my own suggestion would be that there are council meetings. Uh, they're posted on the city's website uh, from public meetings. You can attend those meetings, uh, particularly when that matter is being discussed. Um, uh, there's often subcommittee meetings, and you can look for those committee meetings to discuss the matter. Um, but always look and see if it's on the agendas, uh, because if it's not on the agenda, it may not be appropriate to discuss that matter that night. Sure. Yes, I'm sorry, Council didn't just remind me. So because the item is actually in the Council's packet, there's a, uh, at the front of the agenda for the packets, there's a docket of all the items and committee uh, items. And it, because it's one of those items, you could uh, speak a public comment. In that case, you'd want to show up at the beginning of the Council meeting, sign up on the, the little clipboard that's there, um, so you can speak at the beginning of the meeting. So um, my question actually was a little bit relative to the last one, but more to the point um, about the referendum, the possibility of a referendum question. Um, do all of you believe that putting that question to the public in a special election in 2018 is going to reflect anywhere close to the outcome of the 2016 election? Is that, a, is that in any way a fair thing to put on, on the city at all? knowing what the typical outcome is of a small midterm special election. Is that, has anyone thought uh, of that? Well, has anyone I'll just say for myself, I don't deal with the elections process per se, or the ballot questions, um, but I do think wherever possible for questions like these, if they are going to ballot, it makes sense to have the broadest possible turnout. Okay. Um, but other than that, I can't speak to the likely effects because I don't uh, deal with the ballot questions or the elections process that, that much. Right, I, so. I can speak to what has occurred in other parts of the state where they have had special elections, including in towns that voted yes. We've seen a fraction 
of the turnout that happened in a presidential election. Uh, and it's not just because of this issue, that's what we always see. This was passed during a presidential election. If it's in an off-year election, um, or if it's a special election, uh, you, even, you even see a much more diminished turnout. So you see a tiny percentage of the turnout that you'd see in 2016. And generally, uh, the polls will tell you that the people that turn out in special elections skew uh, older and more conservative as right. well. So that is, that is one pretty much major point that I'd like to make to everyone, counselors, the panel, everybody. My second question, because it is somewhat relevant, this community panel that was put together however long ago you mentioned, how many members on this panel are proponents of retail in Newburyport? Uh, um, just for clarification, do you, are you referring to the ad hoc group that was yes. created? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that just for clarification for everyone else here, that's actually a different group than is up here. Um, so we have some of the same folks actually here uh, from that group, but it, okay. um, not everybody on the group is represented here. But it was the idea was a group of stakeholders from the community, uh, elected officials, appointed officials, uh, professionals in different departments, um, and some um, who work on uh, drug prevention in the community and so forth, meeting to talk about what would be the appropriate way of regulating the marijuana uses uh, in Newburyport. Uh, and that's where the discussion started up about what districts or areas of the city to allow retail in if that was the direction we wanted to go in. Um, the, as far as the, the representation across the group, I think uh, we didn't really get into the question of um, who's for, who is against per se. Uh, it was more about the practical uh, implications of putting the uses in one zone or another that we discussed primarily. Um, but uh, if you know, we can get back to, to you if you want a list of all the members that were there, but we didn't get into individual positions on for or against the use itself. Right, but given who's on that ad hoc, mm -hmm. would you say that there is anyone who's not an opponent and that is having this significant sway with what they're suggesting to the council, to City Hall? I mean, it, it, is there not a fairly skewed perspective there? Being that there's no community members involved, there really wasn't any information at all for anyone else that might be actually just as knowledgeable and interested in partaking in that conversation, but is sure. not an opponent. I, I guess what I would say to that, not being able to answer your question specifically because that would involve some discussion with other folks and, and their positions, but um, I think one thing that might be helpful is because there will be a series of upcoming meetings that deal with this particular issue, the retail sales, this would be an opportunity to help balance out if you're concerned about that, to help balance that out by attendance or um, reaching out to members, having you know those that you're... Um, you know, who are of the similar mindset of your, as yourself, reaching out to counselors at the public meetings. There will be a joint public hearing between the planning board and city council to discuss the retail sales areas again. Mm -hmm. So um, I would suggest attending those meetings and reaching out to the city council members or the planning board members um, about that. So in short, no, the, the group was formed of just concerned parties that- would I, I, would, I guess I would say it was likely yeah. stakeholders, um, likely stakeholders. Okay, that's one way to put it, I guess. <laughs> so, Sorry. thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, assuming that new report takes this opportunity to, you know, get the revenues that we would have from retail sales, is there any legislation determining who is allowed to purchase as far as residents? Do you have to be a state resident in order to purchase? I just haven't seen anything in the language of the law. You do not have to be a state resident. You just have to present a valid ID that proves that you're 21 or over. Okay, so this actually could be a benefit in regards to the large amount of tourists that we get in this city every year. That That's take correct. Advantage of that. yes. Just wanted to point that out. Well, thank you for everyone who put this together. I think this is really helpful. Um, I have two, I think, quick questions. The first one was for Jim. I just wanted to clarify. When you were going over the requirements and security and the surveillance cameras, you had said that the, I think the exterior ones would make it easier for the police. So does that mean that they're, it's kind of their purview to be reviewing that, kind of like the in-street cameras, or if something were to happen, it would be a resource? Um, I think it'd be both. 
And the, you, do you mean, is there going to be a direct link? Is it their responsibility to, to be monitoring? So the we police have, responsibility? The it is not the police. No, okay, no, no, no. Okay, so no. it's just a resource. Because I know we have some set up in, in town that they The tapes would be stored and saved. If police had some reason to say something occurred on the street, maybe your cameras may have caught it, they'd be able to access those, those okay. tapes. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. And the other, I think, may have been answered um, from some of the others. But so um, if you are approved to open one of these stores, you can sell anything. So it's the, you know, the, the cannabis itself, the food, the, there aren't different levels of what you sell. It's you could sell any of them. And do generally people do, do they sell the full range of products in your experience? You know, that... Well, I can only talk about medical at this point, and they do sell a full range of products, um, only because a lot of people, uh, some people don't want to put smoke in their lungs. They just don't. We're a healthier society now than maybe we were years ago. Some people choose an edible. Uh, some people live in an apartment where smoking is not allowed. Mm -hmm. Remember, landlord rights are protected under this. They can say, look, no smoking, no growing in the unit that you're renting from me or in a public housing development. Those people have no choice but to have an edible product. So they can choose to sell anything they want, okay. but they have the ability to sell any product that's permitted by the Cannabis Control Commission. And the commission, that means you know brownies and food and the things that we've been talking about with the packaging. As long as it's properly packaged, properly inspected, and properly labeled, yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I had just two quick questions. One related to, are there any categories of consumables that are regulated or off limits, like you know, THC vaping oil type stuff that has no scent and would be kind of hard to control public consumption? Yep. That's an ongoing process for us. Um, we're looking at, you know, we've been working with local boards of health, um, looking at the experience of other states. Um, you know, right now we don't have a big list of prohibited products. Um, as, as facilities get up and running, that's something that we're going to keep, you know, sort of an evolving eye on. Um, but right now, that's not, we're not trying, we're not going and saying you can sell this particular kind of thing and you can't sell this particular kind of thing. Okay, thank you. And the second one might not be answerable, but um, I travel quite a bit for work to Oregon, San Francisco, Denver, et cetera, and it feels like, um, I totally agree that the level of consumption is probably similar and regulating it's a good idea and all the rest of that keep people safe. Um, it feels like acceptance of public consumption has gone sort of blasé and if there's a way to counsel towns to help enforce that somehow where it's not like, you know, you can flick a cigarette button, it's not littering, right, for whatever reason. Um, you, go down to Cat, you go down to the waterfront park at Yankee Homecoming and it's not 20%, hey, people are lighting up and it just it is what it is because it's a new culture now. How do towns really address that aggressive ticketing or, I don't know. How's we, that? we have local ordinances that govern, govern that. So, um, in, in, it's same as public drinking. It's no different, so. Yeah, it's probably it, more enforcement. Like when I, when I go out in those, those major metropolitan towns that I talk about, I almost don't want to walk around in the evenings because it's like one giant smoke screen, unfortunately. Sometimes you gotta pick your battles. Yeah. Well, I just, I'd hate to see that battle completely get lost in our little town. That was my only concern. But thank you. Hello. Um, I have two questions, actually. Uh, one of the, I actually lived in Colorado for three years, and this whole debate was, you know, going on. And one of the things that came up was um, the smell. You know, there were some, there were some complaints about um, areas close to the cultivation uh, centers um, up in Colorado, they were pretty far out and removed, but there were farm, farmers that were complaining about the smell. And um, So one of the things, I have two daughters in the public schools here, and, and it's not that far off from where you're talking about, and I was wondering if that 500 feet uh, buffer zone, is, a, is that uh, flexible, or is that really, is that standard, and is that staying, is that at, at all flexible? And my second question, actually, if you want to respond to that first, that's fine. Uh, well, I'll speak from the local sure. perspective um, that we uh, went along in part with the state uh, standard, if you will, that's in the CCC regulations, but we also expanded that. So there are some other, quote, protected uses that are buffered um, beyond what the, the bare minimum the state uh, requires. Um, but that was, well, it, I am sure is in part to address something like that. We actually have explicit language in the zoning ordinance that the council recently adopted that re would require uh, any sort of impact on abutters, whether it be noise, not 
noxious fumes, things like that, to be addressed by the applicants. So in this case, what I would expect, although we haven't had an application for this use yet, is that the board would look at the applicant's proposal, would require them to demonstrate that they have some order control mechanisms in place. We've heard about carbon filters and things like that. Um, and then we would have to see once, assuming the business got started, we would have to you know, take a look and see essentially, is it working properly? Are there any abutters who are being impacted? Is the system working properly? And if it's not, they would then have to re revise that system to correct the issue if there was still uh, a problem. But the ordinance that we have locally does contemplate that and gives the planning board the authority to enforce that and then uh, by extension our zoning administrator. And if, if the issue is not fixable and they can't correct what happens? It's because it's a requirement of the ordinance. I mean, I, I would hope we wouldn't get to a, a, you know, a situation like that, but if that were the case, technically the business would have to shut down because okay. it could not meet the requirements of the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And my second question was, I was curious if, the, if, if there has been a discussion with the planning board about actually ha having the retail stores in town, center, in the center of the town, um, there and, and what the pros and cons were that were discussed. Sure. Uh, well, there's a very brief discussion, really, with the planning board. There was a joint public hearing that was held uh, relative to the, I want to say, the first round of, of the zoning amendment that Council Junta mentioned that came in in January. Um, there was a discussion briefly about where retail sales should go. Uh, I had done a just a slide presentation showing the different areas that were possibilities, if you will. Uh, I think we would all, hopefully in the room, recognize that putting in residential districts probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This is, regardless of whether you support it or not, it's a retail use of, of a nature, so you wouldn't put that typically in a residential district. So what we're left with is the defaults that you look at on a zoning map are retail districts. So that means the Story Avenue area, the Route 1 traffic circle by the, the train station down there, and then the downtown. And I, perhaps that would you, what, that's what you mean maybe by the town center. Yeah. Um, so those areas were discussed. There was actually even a brief discussion of whether or not the hospital district, which happens to be uh, a medical district, would make sense given that it's, uh, there's medical sales of marijuana. That wasn't you know, something that was supported by the ad hoc group, um, at least those stakeholders. So there was discussion about those other locations, but it was very brief, and I think partly because there was an agreement relatively early on in those discussions to postpone the lo location of marijuana sales to have that um, the uh, moratorium put in place so we could have a more thorough discussion about that through another forum. And uh, other counselors have sponsored an amendment to bring that discussion forward again so that we can have that simultaneous with discussions about a ballot question so that regardless of what the result of the ballot question is, if, if it is going to be allowed at, at the end of the ballot question, we know where we're going to put it. Okay. Um, so that conversation is going on. And, and can and can that discussion happen before the ballot? If the ballot is is written and put it to the public, can that discussion be? Yes, made most definitely. Okay. Yep. All right. And I, as planning director, I'd recommend that because I think it's better for us to be prepared regardless of the outcome. Okay. So. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Nervous going up here. Um, thank you very much for this information. I really learned quite a bit today. Um, I was mostly kind of surprised, almost hard to believe that. It sounded, I got the message that we're gonna make, make, make money and that it's gonna cost us nearly nothing. And, um, yeah, <laughs> oh, hi. other people got that impression too. Um, I have first turned experience that this city, this state, this country doesn't have enough money in mental health and substance abuse. There's not enough beds for people of psychotic breaks or anything like that. With more available marijuana use and the money that will come in, will that money be directed to get more beds and more treatment centers for abuse? Um, well, I, I don't deal as much with the financial questions, but I do know that there's uh, the assumption that I have heard, at least internally, and never mind the, the sort of state level assumptions, but that some of those funds that are taken in would be used to help with drug prevention uh, efforts. Uh, but I, I can't speak to the, the exact issue because I don't deal with the financial aspects of that. Uh, that's really a new frontier for us, if you will, and those decisions will be made uh, in the coming weeks or months. Yeah, I, I just kind of <clears throat> would like to add to that, that, uh, yeah, uh, no, no one is really looking at the harms and the impacts. I mean, I hear Mr. Borgasani, who is from the Marijuana Public Policy, this is the lobbying group that's been all over the country uh, promoting uh, marijuana medical 
legalization retail. In, in, the, in the current state of Colorado, the latest revenue statement from uh, the Colorado Department of Revenue shows they are collecting $250 million in tax revenue. A lot of money, okay? That money is coming from 22% of the users, and those users are using up to three to four joints a day, every day. They're totally stoned, which means they're totally non-productive. I don't know what they do, but they are certainly a burden on society. I mean, we, we've, this is an alcohol model. Well, we know what alcohol does. Center for Disease Control says, uh, cost this country $249 billion a year for alcohol abuse. And it has the same problem. There's a 10 or 15% of alcohol users that just drink every single day. They're non-productive, they have medical issues because of that. And again, you can tally up and say, oh, the public health bill hasn't increased. That's because they don't increase it. It's not because there's not a need there. But anyway, I want to get off that. Oh, the other comment, we do can I, have... Can I ask you, please, do you have a question that you want to ask? I know your opinions yeah, yeah. are very valuable. Yeah, but other people were doing it. Okay, if I will... you have a question... Yes, I did, you. okay. Uh, 935-500-110, uh, that's the advertising regulation that the Cannabis Commission needs to enforce. And I was very surprised that it allows television and radio advertising. I know not supposed to be to minors. I don't know how you're going to enforce that. But uh, you can't advertise whiskey. You can't advertise spirits. So I'd like to know if there's going to be any change to that. It also says uh, they're going to control the internet. Well, I can log on to any uh, marijuana uh, supplier in Colorado and I get to their website, it'll ask me, are you over 21? I type in 21, I'm 21. It believes me every time, and I get access to all the information. I can get a joint for 10 bucks, I can get a discount of 10% because I'm actually a senior, students get a 5%. Anyway, I don't know, how are you gonna enforce uh, advertising on the internet? I'd like to hear that from the commissioner, not from the representative of the industry. Sure, so to address the first part of your question, uh, which was about looking at impacts, uh, I'm pleased to say that we've hired uh, Julie, Julie Johnson, who uh, comes to us from Johns Hopkins. She's our research director, um, and she's gonna be putting together actually a pretty big staff with a very robust research agenda. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty actually proud to say that Massachusetts is gonna be among the forefront of the research of this industry. Um, one of the things we've been able to do is look at how other states have done this. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen is that often some of the research comes after, and in some cases a little bit further after um, sales begin than we'd like, and what we're doing is trying to make sure that we're keeping an eye on these things and really trying to dig down into the studies that we've been prohibited from doing for so long um, so that we can have educated answers to the questions that you're asking. Um, she's, she just gave a big update on our research agenda at our last public meeting last week, and she's going to continue to do so in our public meetings going forward. And I, I would encourage you to take a look at those. I, I think she's going to be doing some great work, and it's going to bring some good information um, to us as, as, and to citizens of you know, to places like Newburyport and elsewhere that are looking at those questions. Uh, in terms of the advertising, uh, we're looking at similar restrictions online. Um, and as you raise, I mean, as you say, it's, it's difficult. Um, you can't. There's no way to, sim to simply say, well, if you're, over 20, or if you're under 21, you can't get in. We're asking you to verify that. Um, but we are limiting sales online. You're going to need to go into a brick and mortar store for the most part. Um, we've looked at the question of delivery, of social consumption. Um, there was a lot of, we got a lot of comment about that at our public hearings. And so that, that part of it's been pushed off. We're going to be opening, we're going to be looking at those questions again um, sometime this fall or maybe early next spring. Um, you know, but this is an evolving process. We're looking at ways to make it better. Um, and we, we made those decisions about advertising after you know, a month and a half of exhaustive, laborious uh, public hearings where we heard from every possible segment of society. We wanted, we wanted to do our best to balance between citizens groups, between industry groups, uh, between local officials, between state officials. Uh, and this was our best, 
uh, effort to try to make sure that it was a balanced approach. Uh, and it's something that we'll continue to look at as we move forward, certainly. Um, you know, it, and we, we're the first to acknowledge that our regulations aren't perfect, but they are certainly the best that we could do. And, and as the industry gets up and running, we're going to continue to look at this uh, to make sure that we've got the, the safest and most effective uh, marijuana regulations in the country, at least as far as we can do it. And I think J uh, Jim had a, a couple of things he wanted mm -hmm. to say as well. Yeah, just the point about Colorado, uh, the, the speaker mentioned um, a lot of people being, I don't know how he worded it, stoned in Colorado. The fact is, Colorado has the fastest growing economy in the nation for the past three years. Denver has been, I think, chosen by Fortune Magazine um, or awarded by Fortune Magazine as the best city to do business in. It's not because of the cannabis industry, uh, but it's because, you know, it's almost... It, it contradicts opponents' fears that somehow cannabis was going to collapse Colorado society. Society in Colorado is doing very well. The economy is doing very well, better than uh, any, other na uh, any other state in the nation at this point. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much. I thought this was very informative. I certainly learned a lot tonight, and I, I want to thank the City Council for putting this forum together. Um, and I have 12 questions, uh, but unfortunately, none of you can answer them. They are all actually directed for the city council. So my question really ultimately is, are we planning to have a forum like this for the city of Newburyport, uh, whether that be a committee? Uh, I've spoken several times now at city council, and that's a one-way conversation. Are we going to have an opportunity to have a two-way conversation with the city council on this topic? Do we, do we, I think the answer is that there are city councilors that would welcome that. And so the question is just how to get that done. So I, okay, great. And so Heather Shand, who is going to be our speaker as soon as we have these last two questions, will touch on that. And let's make sure that you get what you asked for. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I, let's make sure you get what you asked for. Hi. Um, I just had a question for um, the marshal and for the health department. From your perspective, if you had to say where you would like to see the shops situated. Uh, I've, I've said and I've spoke to many councilors, uh, Story Avenue would be my choice, if I had to make a choice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Frank from the health department. Uh, in terms of location and preferable locations, obviously we... Uh, um, City Council thought about it and board of health perspective is just like um, tobacco stores, you want to keep them away from obviously schools and sensitive areas like that. Um, but it was a tough decision in terms of where um, they should, should go. And again, that was looked at and um, whether it be downtown or by Story Ave. So we just try to uh, limit the exposure to um, to the young kids mm -hmm. and try to stay away from those areas. Thank you. I'm just curious, how do you measure the amount that is dangerous or that will harm others, um, especially when driving? I own a small business in town and I have to insure delivery drivers as well as people that use sharp equipment. So your question is impaired driving? Impaired driving, hiring people, allowing them to consume cannabis because it will be legal. Um, well, how do a, I provide a measurement to be able to have these employees? Well, there is no measurement as far as there's medical measurements and things like that. But uh, as far as people out there driving around and smoking and under the influence, um, we've had something in place for many years called drug recognition experts. Um, but there's not many of those, and it's very extensive training. It's very expensive, so in order for a police department to maintain that, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's, uh, it's ongoing training. Um, so right now we have officers going through uh, what's called A-Ride. It's, uh, it's a new training. It's advanced roadside um, impaired driving enforcement, and it's helping officers to recognize uh, Impaired driving while you're under drugs. There's a lot of um, been impaired driving with drugs. It's it's uh, people are driving on a prescribed drugs that are impaired, so it's no different. But it's uh, 
it's more difficult and there's no measurement for us as a tool like we have our portable breathalyzer test or our breathalyzer test. There's nothing like that right now to, to measure that for us. Shouldn't that occur before we actually potentially legalize it though? I mean, like to that's, me, I mean, I know it's far too late, but. That's way beyond me. Okay. I mean, will there be something in the very near future, do you think? I probably won't see it, but uh, I would imagine there's going to be something coming down the road, and whoever invents it's going to make a lot of money. Okay. Thank you. And I will say in response to that, uh, just reference again that we do have this operating under the influence working special commission that's put together um, that's working on at, at least looking at these issues. You know, it, we're not going to invent a, you know, a breathalyzer equivalent, but we do want to at least look at how we get to addressing some of those questions. So again, I'd, I'd really urge you to look at it, and you're welcome to come to the public meetings and, and listen to the, the discussion there. Um, as I mentioned, the next one's July 3rd at 3 p.m. Hi there, I just have two questions um, for the gentleman from the Cannabis Commission. I think one of the biggest things I'm struggling with is the buffer zones, um, you know, the 500 foot default by the state. The challenge that I'm seeing, and I'm speaking for myself, so I'm not speaking for anybody else, is that the, the buffers are very challenging in Newburyport because it's a tight city and unfortunately residential has encroached quite a bit on retail. We have schools and places where children congregate in almost every zone. So I'm curious to hear your perspective on from the 85 or however many applications you have, are you seeing cities de decrease that 500 foot buffer? What is your experience so far with the, with the empirical evidence you have from other applications, are, are a lot of communities facing what we're facing and bringing down that 500 foot buffer? Are they sticking with it? Uh, in our case, some of the maps get squished down to almost nothing when you apply 500 foot buffer. That's a big zoning challenge for us and I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've actually been to a couple meetings like this where we faced the exact same question. So I think we have seen, um, especially the closer you get to Boston, I think the more you see um, the reduction in that, that buffer zone, but I've seen it all over the state for the same exact reason. There's oddly shaped cities. There's cities that are in cities and towns that have that same problem. Uh, I think in the city of Boston, for instance, and not to make it Boston centric, but just as an example, if they abided by the 500 foot um, buffer zone, that would automatically put them below that 20% threshold with no additional action on the part of the city. Uh, just because there's so many other you know, factors between schools and residential areas, et cetera. So I, we've actually seen a number of cities and towns make adjustments to that buffer zone to make sure that their zoning is, um, their zoning makes sense. Okay. Um, and that's, they've, I've seen some that have dropped up to 300. There's some that have made sort of exceptions for certain things um, based on where they want it to be located. Um, but I mean, there's been cities and towns we've, we've spoken to that want to even put, say, a, a cultivator in an industrial zone, but it's that 500 feet still puts it, you know, abutting up to one of the, one of the categories. So there's, there have been a lot of, empirically, just looking at the numbers of them that have changed uh, or that have addressed this, there have been a lot that have adjusted that buffer okay. zone. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that's a big, I think, one of, maybe one of our biggest challenges. My second question for you is, um, what happens if a city, and let's say, let's say uh, you have two licenses available in Newburyport, that's how the math works out, and you cannot come to an agreement on a host agreement, then it never makes it to the CCC, it, it, it stops there if no host agreement can be reached between the community and the, the prospective business, cultivator or retail? Yeah, that's correct. As part of their application packet, they have to have that signed community host agreement. Um, in packet number one, as I as I laid out my in the presentation. So if that's not if that's not signed, we'll get the application. We'll send a form back to the municipality. Uh, in this case, to the mayor's office, uh, and the mayor's office would say no, it's not compliant. And then no, they haven't signed um, the community host agreement, uh, and it would stop there for us. Okay. And last question is again based on the applications you've seen. Is everything pretty much the six percent three plus three? on the retail side and, and three on the cultivation side? Is that the trend has been the max out of the local option? Uh, is that been your, I mean, I know you're just reviewing them getting started, sure. but I just want to see where other folks are headed. Yep, generally that's what we've seen. Okay. Um, honestly, there's only been, I think, two or three that have gone at two, and I think that those were cities or towns that actually were so proactive uh, in setting up their bylaws that they did that before the re law was rewritten to allow for 3%. Uh, under the original law, it was only, it was two percent at the lo at the local level. Okay. Um, so we have we have seen largely them looking at that that three percent number. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Great, quest great questions, fascinating answers. My last introduction is Ward 3 City Councilor Heather Shand. Oh, Jesus, making notes. <laughs> to wrap it up. So first, thank you all for coming and getting into the weeds with us. We have been dealing with this for <laughs> six months now. Hey, I heard that on NPR this morning. I had to use it. So thank you all. Um, your thoughtful and considerate questions were so appreciated tonight. It just shows how much of an engaged community we have, and it is so appreciated. Um, going forward, I can assure you we will be using these comments, and it will help direct us in what we do. So the Go Forward plan is Planning and Development Committee members from the City Council are Jared Igerman, Larry Jensen, and myself, and we are committed to working on the zoning. So we will have those two-way conversations. Connie, I promise you that. So we will advertise those meetings, and public comment is appreciated, so please come, all of you. We will make sure that it is on the, council, um, it is on the planning board site, it is on the City Council site, and we will make sure it goes out via social media and all of our emails. So please stay engaged. We do appreciate that. Um, thank you all, the panel, for being on this. Coming tonight, I mean, you all took the brunt of the, com of the comments. So thank you, Andy. <laughs> thank you, Marshall Murray. Thank you, Frank. Susan, I think you got off. <laughs> 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 and Jim and Dave, very much appreciated. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> And that, and also, I really do want to thank Councilor Khan. She was the one that was instrumental in setting up this forum and deserves a, all of our <laughs> And to our facilitator, so thank you. All right, thank you all for coming out. Have a good evening. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm speaking for myself here, but if you really have, want to have a one-to-one -one interactive conversation, our telephone numbers and emails are on the city website. Uh, I, I certainly would welcome any discussion with anybody, and I'm betting uh, the other 10 councillors would as well. Thanks, so, Charlie. Great. Thank you all.